starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. 
audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks.
audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. 
Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts. Sorry, I was muted. We're now live. Great. Thanks so much, Cameron. I'll open the meeting of Thursday the 20th of August. Thanks everyone for joining us and a reminder that we are live and have members of the public listening in and we're also recording the meeting. We have an apology from the Mayor, Councillor Albert Van Zetten. Are there any other additional apologies? Just check for the purpose of the recording who we've got. Councillor Finlay? Here. Councillor Soward? Yes. Councillor McKenzie? Yes. Councillor Cox? Happy to be here. Councillor Stosenjek? Here. Councillor Dawkins? Here. Councillor Daking? Present. Councillor Spencer? Yes. Councillor Harris? Here. And Councillor Walker? Yes, here. Thanks so much. We'll move to item three, declarations of interest. Are there any councillors who wish to declare an interest? 13.1, Deputy. 13.1, Councillor Spencer. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Item four is the confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of August. Do we have someone who's happy to move that motion? So moved, Deputy. Councillor Cox, someone to second. Councillor Spencer. Councillor Cox, do you wish to speak to the motion? Oh, I don't think so, Deputy. <clears throat> Councillor Spencer, do you wish to speak to the motion? No, thanks, Deputy. Does any uh, councillor wish to make a contribution to item four? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Again, say no. <clears throat> the minutes are confirmed as a true and correct record. We now move to item six, petitions, 6.1, the receipt of the petition uh, concerning the composting facility in St. Leonard's. Happy to move that, Mayor. Uh, acting Mayor, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Chairperson of the meeting, in fact. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Happy Thank to second you. it. Happy second. Councillor Finlay and Councillor McKenzie. May Councillor... I ask a question on that one, Chair? Yes, the... Councillor Finlay, go ahead. Um, through you, perhaps, to the CEO, could, can I just get some clarification, CEO, on um, with this petition and the timing of the petition and the consideration of the development application that it um, relates to, one, is it likely that this matter will return prior to consideration of the DA? And the numerous representations that were received for the DA, can you confirm, please, that they will all go to the EPA and maybe just outline what happens with those? Thanks, Councillor Finlay. CEO. Um, yeah, in terms of the petition, it is likely that we will deal with it um, in a timely manner. We've got 42 days, but we will we will bring it back quickly in respect of being able to provide some clarity around that for the petitioners in terms of um, what is being asked of us. I certainly can confirm that, that any representation that was made in respect to, to the development through the, the, the DA process um, have been referred to the EPA for, an, for, for consideration in their assessment. Um, and they'll also be considered um, as uh, part of the council assessment once we receive the the um, the, the work back, the, the assessment back from the EPA. So I think that was the, the, the questions you asked. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, CEO. Councillor Finlay, any further questions? No, thank you. We'll move the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 In, any against? The motion is carried. Item 6.2 is the receipt of a second petition concerning the installation of speed humps in Invermay. Someone to uh, move the receipt of the petition. Happy to move. Thanks, Councillor Soward. A seconder? Happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor Harris. All those in favour of receiving the petition, please say aye. 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 Those against, say no. That motion is carried. Thank you. We now move to there being no community reports. Um, item eight on the agenda. Mm. Item 8.1, public questions 
on notice. CEO, do we have any public questions uh, on notice? They are received, they are listed there. Uh, we'll move to 8.2, public questions without notice. Thank you, uh, Leanne, who I believe is reading the first question. Thank you, Chair. This question is from Mr. Ray Norman of Trevallon. In the context of the Council implementing a cultural strategy, a number of issues arise that need to be addressed given what has been invested in the process over an extended period involving external experts at considerable expense to the Council's constituents and whose advice has essentially remained confidential on the premise that the consultant's reports are confidential operational documents albeit that the subject of the reporting is the region's communities of ownership and interests, cultural realities and cultural landscaping, albeit that in large measure, the subject communities have been excluded from the process and moreover, the draft strategy reveals itself as being a strategy to have a strategy without articulating objectives and rationales for them as typically strategic plans do in order to be meaningful, inclusive and effective, therefore arguably rendering the current council process relatively purposeless, leading towards some form of a rendition of the council operations managerially preferred outcome, essentially framed in isolation and insulated from any kind of critical interrogation that might lend it an element of vernacular relevance of the kind the draft strategy purports to embrace via an obscure algorithm apparently devised and designed to collect personal data on a promise that it will be held in confidence even though the internet site is blighted by broken links and arguably seeking information that might allow for the community of ownership and interest to be characterised as culturally singular, as it might once have been understood, rather than diverse and dynamic, as anthropology tells us Australian, indeed Tasmanian communities are currently. And in the light of that, will Council revise and review the process to enable a citizens' assembly to interrogate the current process thus far and plot a more inclusive way forward towards developing a dynamic understanding of the actual cultural realities currently in play. Thank, Thank you. you, Leanne. The question in respect to the establishment of citizen assemblies has been previously addressed by this council. The council intends to maintain its focus on our existing engagement processes, for example, the Tomorrow Together initiative. Thank you. The second question from Mr Norman, which I understand is to be read by Kelsey. Thank you. In the context of Launceston's declaration of a climate emergency, the issue of peri-urban agriculture arises relative to planning and placemaking, and arguably especially so relative peri-urban land in regions such as to be found around Launceston, given that peri-urban agriculture systems are characterised as agricultural ecosystems that provide goods and services related to leisure and recreation. The process development beneficial to the environment, such as fixing CO2, the safe and secure production of healthy food and the preservation of natural and cultural landscapes. There are powerful arguments given the disruptions increasingly evident as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. For these factors being an integral and proactive components of civic planning processes going forward, given the emerging, emerging weaknesses <coughs> and unanticipated consequences of global supply chain strategies that are currently threatening food security across Australia due to the concentration corporate suppliers operating by and large outside the Aegis strategic governance imperatives and given that it is at stake and at risk, it is now increasingly important in the current climate emergency and the COVID-19 pan pandemic crisis, that there is a context that underpins the importance of peri-urban planning, will Council now move proactively to initiate a citizens' assembly process designed and devised to engage with the community experts with the relevant experience, expertise and qualifications to appropriately inform a peri-urban agricultural policy relevant to the geo-region and more specifically the catchments of the three rivers 
Islands and their hinterlands towards putting in place a policy relevant to local governance's purpose and consistent with that ensure the council officers undergo appropriate professional development in order that they are enabled to implement such a community-driven policy framed in a 21st century context. Thanks, Kelsey, for that question. This response to the question has been provided in the previous answer to the previous question. The third question from Mr Norman to be read by Leanne. Thank you, Chair. Against the background of the current recession, depression impacting upon communities across Australia and the ways that the COVID-19 pandemic crisis is apparently prolonging and further impacting upon small business operators' opportunities, and the corporate sectors challenging the long-term economic viability of an increasing number of business operations, all of which is increasingly being adversely affected by the insecurity of global supply chains, the effects of which we can expect to have trickle-down impact on regional communities, such as those to be found in Northern Tasmania. The economic outlooks for the region are no longer as secure or anticipatable as has been asserted based on past indications and assertions of media commentators, economic analysts, bankers and the corporate sector more generally, all of which are currently highly contestable as time progresses, not to mention the disruption of what was once understood as the economic norm and the dissipation and the changing relevance of central business districts in the wake of people increasing dependence of online supply chains, all of which impacts upon local government's ability to demand ever increasing funding levels from constituents and fiscal accountability being almost entirely delivered by the Auditor General's assessment of the Council's financial, financial reporting's accuracy. It is arguably time to revise Council's medium to long-term fiscal viability projections and to pay very close attention to the Council's accumulated debt liabilities in the context of ratepayers' capacity to meet the anticipated rate demands looking ahead in the light of extravagant salary levels and the questionable, questionable development priorities, will Council now enlist the support of a recognised expert forensic economic analyst in order that the Council and its constituency can more confidently plot a viable and affordable way forward for both ratepayers and residents in the short term and also looking forward for a decade plus? Uh, thanks, Leanne. This question was previously answered by Council at the meeting held on the 23rd of July. It's important to note that the Council is continuing to work on revisiting its long-term financial plan and has no plan to enlist the support of an external economic analyst at this time. The next question comes from Mr Lionel Morell, President of the Tasmanian Ratepayers Association Launceston and will be asked by Kelsey. Collectively, the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery stakeholder Ratepayers and donors have accumulated collection assets in the order of $240 million, have underwritten in the recurrent budget something in the order of $60 million plus over the last decade, have funded significant capital expenditure that Council argues is confidential as an operational matter, has largely excluded ratepayers from taking any part in or being permitted to offer comment, criticism or critique relative to such operational matters, and that pre-COVID-19 stakeholders and ratepayers have been underwriting the QV mags costs in excess of $50 per visitor per annum. Then over time, on our assessment, Council has failed or has been unable to provide expert institutional governance and it is very concerning to rate payers that Council has allowed for the blending of the functions of governance and management. This has reduced the QV mag's capacity to operate purposefully and deliver on performance indicators determined collectively by governance and funding agencies and in turn seriously reduced its funding opportunities. Further, this diminishes and devalues the trust the ratepayers and supporters have invested in QV mag and security of its collections and is against the interest of stakeholders in Tasmania nationally and internationally. Council has been unsuccessful in shaming our state government into trebling the funding it currently provides. Co consequent to all of this, will Council now consider abdicating its governance role in favour of an expert commissioner and board of governors formally charged with proactively reviewing and renewing the QV MAG charter and a purposeful strategic plan? 
transi transition the QVMAG into a standalone regional community cultural trust, say, within a decade, establishing working entrepreneurial alliances um, with like institutions in Tasmania nationally and internationally and consider doing this in the current financial year. Thanks, Kelsey. The Council is in the process of completing a review of the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery, which will address the matters raised in this question. It is intended that the details of this review will be publicly released later this year. The next question comes from Mr Basil Fitch of South Launceston and will be read by Leanne. Thank you, Chair. At a 2018 council meeting, I asked why the council did not allow the show society to have RV overnight parking, which would have brought in $70,000 per annum for the society. The answers made it clear to everyone that the council had no intention of assisting the show in any way whatsoever. Why is the council now doing the opposite and helping you, Taz, with its unpopular plan on showground? Thanks, Leanne. The Council has supported the show society both financially and professionally over many years, has previously answered the proposal for RV parking use on the site is contrary to the interim planning scheme. UTAS and the show society reached a mutual agreement in respect to the planned future for this site and the Council is proceeding in accordance with the agreed intent. Question two to be read by Kelsey. Before that, MP for Bass, Mr Nicklick, was going to get federal funding or a grant for the show society to do the roundhouse area up because he thought their plan was a good one. But the council said no. So even then, council stimmied the society's effort to improve the Launceston show and to raise revenue. Council deliberately prevented the show from increasing its revenue from its own lease, but then still turned around and demanded that the society pay the council the $150,000 that council reckoned it owed. Why did the council demand payment from the society when other shows are getting grants and did it threaten the the society with bankruptcy if it did not pay the $150,000, leaving it with no choice but to give up, sell its lease. Thanks, Kelsey. The repayment of any monies owed to the council was a requirement of the current lease with the show society. In agreeing to surrender the lease, the show society agreed to repay the money it owed to the council. It's important to note that the council has never threatened the show society with bankruptcy. The third and final question from Mr Fitch to be read by Leanne. Thank you, Chair. On the subject of York Park budget overrun, I heard councillors going on about if you dig under the ground and it having been an old tip. What rubbish excuses. It has been used for sport and recreation for over 130 years. It became the first showground in 1873 and a football and general sports oval in 1923. In 2019, the costs were to be in renewing the turf without calling for tenders, drainage, it is subtitle, remember, irrigation, sprinklers, fencing, realigning the oval, not a few bits of glass from a 130-year-old tip. What were the real reasons and cost breakdown for the budget overrun on the stadium? Thank you, Leanne. This question has previously been answered at a council meeting and indeed the financial information is available in our council meeting minutes. The final questions today come from Ms Gillian Cotton of Invermay and will be read by Kelsey. Number one, when will all the roadworks, traffic lights, etc., associated with the new Gledo Godrick Street traffic lights Forster Street and the Forster Godrick Street intersection be finished and at what cost to the public purse? Question two, before allowing any more developments in the Lindsay Gledo Godrick Street area, such as Good Guys DA on today's agenda, does the council intend to carry out a study and assessment of the full effects of the altered traffic and light system on traffic flow and congestion right across the associated road street networks area that takes in Lower Charles Street, Lindsay Street, Invermay Road, Boland Street, the Esplanade, Charles Street Bridge, Tamer Street Bridge, the Northern Outlet, at least as far as Mowbray Hill and the east-west flow of traffic. And the third question, 
um, how, when, who and what method will the council use to assess the effects and costs on time residents, commuters, etc., of the altered system on local amenity, traffic flow, saturation, congestion, noise and air pollution? Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, these questions, each of them will be taken on notice and responses will be provided in the council agenda of the 3rd of September. We thank those members of our community for their questions and indeed we thank the staff who read them out. That is appreciated. Under the provisions of the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act of 1993, Council acts as a planning authority in regard to items included in Agenda Item 9, Planning Authority. We now move to Item 9.1, Bulky Goods Service. Do I have someone to move that? Uh, sorry, CEO, oh. are there any um, speakers to the item? Kelsey or Leon? I'm not aware of any, so. No, no thank you. Is. Thanks so much. Someone to move that item, please. Happy to move that, Mayor. Uh, Chair. Thank oh, you. Oh, I second that, Danny, please. Thank you, Councillor Spencer. Uh, mover, Councillor Finlay, do you wish to speak to the item? Yeah, thank you. The report, as outlined in our papers today, identifies the discretions that were considered as part of the assessment. Um, for me personally, having considered all of the assessment associated documentation and the representations, uh, the overwhelming area of thought was around traffic and the traffic impact assessment. Uh, on reading and considering all of those reports, and there were numerous reports created for this item, uh, I feel comfortable with the assessment and I feel comfortable with this development within that broader ecosystem. However, I do want to place on record um, the importance of the unrelated matter to this DA of the master plan, the traffic master plan, the implementation of the recommendations and the commitment to address and continue to make strong decisions to improve the traffic management flow in the area because although this development was considered as a part of the master plan and the additional traffic movements calculated within those assessments, um, this does add to an already challenging environment, but one within which the council and the state have committed to improve. Thank you, Councillor Finlay. Councillor McKenzie has a question. Oh, I do. Th thanks, uh, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, I just was looking at uh, section 23.4.7 in relation to uh, the stormwater uh, uh, activities or complications. And I note there that Taswater made a comment that they cannot accept additional flows of stormwater into this area with the combined system over those currently discharged yet we as council have indicated that we're comfortable with the outcomes. I just wonder, I think I had it explained to me today, but for the public's benefit, whether a, uh, an officer could explain the uh, comments made by Taswater in the context of the responses that we then made. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. General Manager Hurst. Yeah. Um, if, if Kath is there, she's probably best placed to answer that question, Deputy Mayor. Senior Town Planner, Catherine. Um, it's Richard here. I'll I'll take that one if I may. Um, I, I, as when the this this um, this uh, this block that houses the good guys was part of a subdivision of a number of blocks that progressed um, a couple of years ago. During that subdivision, there was a stormwater management plan developed for the entire subdivision. Now, as part of that plan, um, Taswater uh, indicated that they would not accept any more stormwater than is currently being um, uh, that is currently being directed to their system. Now, uh, what the strategy is is that the allowance, so to speak, the amount of stormwater that currently goes to their system is being allocated to this block and then the other blocks in the subdivision will have to detain their stormwater to a calculated amount to ensure that the Taswater um, uh, 
requirement is met. So essentially, rather than giving each block an allocation of stormwater, this block has taken the allowance into the existing infrastructure and the subsequent developments will need to deal with theirs to an enhanced degree to make sure that the system works. That, that system was put in place at the subdivision stage and that's been accepted by council. There's actually an agreement on this title that deals with that. Thank you. Thanks, Manager City Development, Richard. Um, Councillor McKenzie, are there any more questions from No, myself? but I'll leave my hand up as I speak. Sure. Thanks. Councillor Spencer is the seconder. Would you like to speak? Yes, please, Deputy. Um, no doubt the developer for this project has been very good for lots of time over the last 20 so years. My concern is the traffic assessment was done four years ago for this area. Uh, that's before the silos come on, before the new car museum was built. I possibly would like to see a new uh, traffic assessment done for the next projects. Uh, <coughs> I know they allow for a 10% growth, but that might not be enough. Um, it could be up to 600 cars a day, so that's a lot of vehicles. Um, I'd like to know if this traffic work we're doing at Infamay doesn't work, what is our plan B? Um, to build a bridge, we're looking 10 to 15 years away to get the traffic away from MPMA, which is a very concerning. Um, my opinion, Mowbray Roundabout is absolutely brilliant. And I think state growth possibly should have done roundabouts at MPMA. That's my opinion, in Foster and Lindsay Street. They work on the mainland. In Cairns, there's 80,000 cars a day with large roundabouts. We've got about 50,000 a day. So that's my main concern to traffic. Um, but this project meets the criteria and is consistent with what the um, officers are telling us. So I will support it. Thank you, Councillor Spencer. Councillor Harris. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is also perhaps uh, for a council officer if they may be able to provide an update on the traffic light changes. Uh, we're aware that there's been a project to uh, update all of the controllers to the latest uh, technology uh, that couldn't yet be turned on um, until it was uh, completed throughout the city. Uh, and I was just wondering if we could have an update on when that may occur. But in conjunction with that, there were to be changes implemented at the uh, Lindsay Street intersection, uh, I guess, when the Gledo Street lights come on. And if we again have a timeline on that so that we can all perhaps understand what those changes may mean for traffic in this direction, because um, certainly another 600 cars a day does seem to be, you do wonder when the straw will break the camel's back. So I was just wondering if anyone could uh, perhaps enlighten us on that. Thanks, Councillor Harris. General Manager Eberhardt, is that something you're able to... Uh, I, I can. I, I guess it's not relevant to the uh, development application you're considering today. Um, but in, as previously communicated, the um, traffic signal project is on track to be completed by December. Um, and the Gledow and Foster Street works um, to be completed um, this side of Christmas also. Thank you, General Manager. Councillor Harris, are there any further questions? Uh, just a, a comment as much as a question. Um, looking at it, the site today at the Gledo Street uh, and Godrick Street intersection where we're going to have one left-hand turning lane off uh, Godrick Street into Gledo, two right-hand turning lanes uh, turning right and one left-hand turning lane heading away from the city um, where the current bike path goes through that intersection. It seems to be to be a, um, a potentially dangerous intersection for any cyclist and we probably need to consider the route of that bike uh, lane to perhaps a better route that will take the, the bikes away from such a heavy uh, vehicle um, intersection. So uh, that's just something that I'll flag as being needed consideration. Again, it's perhaps not uh, something that this DA is particular referencing, but the cars that will be generated by this development application will in fact be impacting on the safety of those cyclists. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, 
I, I like uh, the speakers before, will support this application. I think probably the two major issues that surround any development in this area is traffic management and probably the flood uh, mitigation strategies. I think the flood mitigation strategies have been in place for quite some time in dealing with the one in 200 flood and the requirements of anybody developing on uh, on the area, on the floodplain areas, to how they build their buildings to ensure that they minimise the impact, uh, both from an emergency point of view and also from the facilities that they build and the people that live there uh, and work there. Um, so I'm very comfortable that that's something that's been done and it was dealt with in regards to the building of the, uh, uh, the levee banks around the whole of the Inveresk area. Um, in relation to the traffic management, it's a, an evolving matter and yes, there was a traffic assessment done some years ago, but as I understand it, A, it took into account uh, future developments on the site uh, and therefore tried to, in, you know, try, try to uh, uh, model uh, what sort of numbers of traffic might evolve as a result of development further on the site. And as I further understand, as each new development comes on site, uh, those assumptions are tested against that traffic uh, assessment. And, uh, and modified and improved as, as the knowledge becomes greater. So as a consequence of that, I mean, I know uh, we're all users of that area. We all understand the traffic issues and the frustrations that uh, we and the rest of our community have in getting in and out of the Bunnings area along uh, Lindsay Street. Uh, and I guess that we've uh, entailed experts to give us advice in regards to the Gledo Street um, uh, outlet uh, the improvements to the access through the middle of the uh, of, of the block there to enable people to escape out of um, uh, out without using Lindsay Street. Um, this other road that now linking into uh, the new development, which is up for approval today, also gives a, another in, inter, entrance for lots of other players. So there's been a lot of work that's gone on in relation to this, and I don't hold myself out to be a traffic expert. Um, I think we've asked many questions, which I think is our job as councillors to interrogate the data that's put before us. Uh, and to the best of my ability, I see that people uh, that are giving us this advice are competent in what they do and how they provide that advice to us. Having said that, uh, we're always continually learning, and I'm sure that as the new traffic uh, measures come into place, we'll continually need to review and adjust and tweak those to make them better for our community in using the using the area. Uh, but I am satisfied that the work that's been done is uh, sufficient to give us this DA um, uh, a tick of approval today. I'd also just like to you know, make the comment about the question I asked before about Taswater. I think there have been a number of people over the journey who have considered that we just tick the box and move on with a lot of these things. So I think it's important to note that Taswater have challenged the amount uh, of sewerage and stormwater that can come out of the system. They've done their judgment in relation to their expertise and knowledge, and they have now determined that with the detention structures that we've got uh, and our advice in regards to how we're going to – how sorry, not our advice, our advice to the people who are developing on those blocks as to how they're going to manage that going forward suggests that it is an all-embracing and we are taking into consideration all of those extra pressures that are being put on our various systems. So based on that, I'm very comfortable, subject to anybody coming up with anything else uh, during today's discussion uh, that would lead me to uh, reflect on the, that, that decision. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Walker? Thank you, Acting Chair, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I would probably echo some of the comments, uh, especially from Councillor McKenzie regarding uh, the stormwater. I'll just start with a question, if I could, um, in regards to that. How, how was it that uh, this application uh, was able to be allowed the full allocation of potential storm runoff from the, from the five subdiv uh, subdivided blocks? How, how does that process occur? Is that something that the developer, being the developer of all five blocks, is able to negotiate, or is that something um, that um, the council is involved in at all? General Manager Hurst. Uh, Richard, are you able to answer that one? I, I, think, I believe that was negotiated at the time of the subdivision and it would have been uh, negotiated with the council um, uh, officers who deal with stormwater at the time and engineering standards. 
Thank you, Manager City Development. As I understand it, sorry, Deputy Mayor, as I understand it, because I was involved in some of those discussions, that there were requirements with respect to the containment of stormwater on on the lots, um, and there's been obviously working worked through the, the balance in respect of what was acceptable by way of on-site um, detention and um, and um, working within the the parameters defined by by Taswater, but it certainly was um, the developer's responsibility to to demonstrate compliance with um, with Taswater's and the council's requirements. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Walker, any further questions? Well, um, I suppose just to comment on that, um, that um, it would then, you know, obviously puts the onus on further developments, you know, to, to take up that, um, um, that, that allocation um, and, uh, you know, one thing we are told about climate change is that, you know, we should expect more severe uh, weather events. So that would include more se potentially more severe flooding. Um, you know, one can only hope that, um, that, that the provisions that are in place would be, um, would be adequate, but it's a, it's a very, very difficult thing to ascertain. It, it does make it um, a, a difficult proposition to support when we are wanting to future-proof our city, um, that we're not necessarily convincingly stepping towards that in everything that we do. I will I will speak, Deputy Mayor. To yes, the... your time's already started, so feel free to continue. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, it, it would appear in this particular area that we've had a, a lot of, of piecemeal development of ideas that have come and gone. We have a mixed use in the area from a, a, a hotel, I'm not sure, is it three or four star hotel, to a, um, a, a cement merchant, um, and now the big box stores. I echo the concerns of, um, of, of parking and traffic. Um, we're not to know what the future developments will be and how much further uh, pressure is put on the traffic system. I understand we have a master plan for the area. Um, it will be tested. Um, it, it might show some improvement, but Launceston is a challenged city in the fact that we are in a, a valley. There are only certain areas where we can channel traffic, um, not dissimilar to Hobart, which, as we all know, are experiencing far more problems than Launceston because they've experienced far more growth and development. Um, there's no reason to think that we won't suffer the same fate. And this type of piecemeal development is becoming increasingly difficult to support when we know it just adds to the load. It adds to the load in this case of stormwater runoff, it adds to the load of traffic management and um, it is, you know, a difficult question to answer, you know, what of the future, what, what impacts will this have in the future of Launceston in 15 years time? Will people look back and say, well, what a crazy idea was that? I tend to think that if we're expecting the type of growth that we're talking about in Tasmania, whether it's because of climate change, um, whether it's because the state government want to push our population to 650,000 by the year 2050, um, I think that we have to increasingly take these things into account. Thank you. Having said all that, if I still have some time left, Deputy Mayor. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Having said all that, I'm reluctantly um, looking to support this um, proposal because I feel as though um, the, the, uh, the Council has done an, a, a quite a bit of work in the area in terms of traffic management. Um, I sort of wait with bated breath, really, to see that that traffic management is, is successful and that the Council very carefully consider any further developments in the area. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Daking. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, I too, like other speakers, uh, speak in support of this development. Um, I encourage development, obviously, in our city, as, as the councillors know, and whilst, yes, we will have growing pains uh, with this type of development, um, these are good problems to have. They're good problems to, to be able to plan and to be able to solve. 
Uh, we want this city to, to prosper and to grow and to see further development. And especially um, when you look back at what was in this area, an old, uh, an old guns mill, um, light industrial, a swamp, um, to what it is now. And I think uh, the, the officers have done a great job uh, with working with the developer. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing them continue to do that so we can see uh, further growth of the city. And as Councillor Walker has said, uh, we can see the uh, improved planning and the improved traffic flow that we all uh, we all want to see and I've got the full confidence that that will happen um, and that will continue to happen. Um, we will have traffic, traffic will be uh, a problem in some period of time during the day, um, always, um, when we have congestion. But it's not there 24-7, it's only there um, for short periods of time, um, yeah, essentially uh, the morning run and the afternoon run. Um, most other times uh, the traffic isn't an issue at all. So uh, I'll close it up and say, I, again, I support the development. I do also wish to um, acknowledge uh, the uh, correspondence I have received from a number of other retailers in the city that are good uh, local businesses that employ local people um, that have acknowledged that uh, whilst they too also support uh, development in the city, they wish to also continue to see local support, local businesses also. That's not a town planning matter, but um, I believe that we'll get support for um, for this development. So thank you, Acting Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Daking. I'm wondering if there are any other contributions from those that haven't yet spoken. Uh, Councillor Soward. Go ahead, Councillor Soward. Thanks, Deputy. Um, look, just to uh, echo uh, and expand a little on Councillor Daking's remarks, um, I think... Uh, sometimes there is a little confusion in terms of what we deal with as a planning authority. Uh, like Councillor Daking and potentially other councillors, I received some representations about this development, not so much worrying about the planning matters, uh, the, you know, the traffic or the other matters so eloquently spoken about by previous councillors. Um, there tends to be, uh, Deputy, uh, an idea out there that council should have the right or, or actually does have the right to control the type of businesses that come into the city. So uh, we somehow have a power to limit, for instance, how many uh, ele electronic shops there might be or bottle shops or coffee shops. Well, all I wanted to say, whilst I uh, echo Councillor Daking's uh, remarks that, uh, you know, there is a very, very important that we do support local, I just wanted to make it clear, Deputy, that that isn't a planning consideration. And I think that a great deal of angst happens sometimes in our community because people mistakenly think that it is. That, uh, uh, you know, we've had many developments in recent times that I'm sure you would remember where people have said, oh, we've got enough of X, Y, Z type of business or they're a national chain, they operate out of Sydney, why are they here? I just wanted to reinforce that and uh, echo the comments of previous speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Soward. Councillor Walker, your hand is up. Do you have another question? Uh, apologies, Chair. I'll take that down. Any other speakers from those that have yet uh, have have not yet spoken? There being none, Councillor Finlay, would you wish to close? No, thank you, Chair. We'll now put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Those, against, those against, say no. The motion is carried. Thank you, Council. Now no longer sits as a planning authority. We now move to item 10, announcements by the Mayor, and the Mayor's announcements are listed in the agenda at 10.1. Item 11, Councillors' reports. I'll start with three uh, things that I would like to report on. The first is that last Thursday, Tourism Northern Tasmania released their new branding and their name change, and they're now known as Visit Northern Tasmania. And I think this is um, a really exciting step 
uh, in terms of that opportunity of knowing where you're going to, to go as a tourist uh, or even as a local, being proud in encouraging and championing people to visit our patch. There were presentations from Minister Sarah Courtney, the Chair of C and CEO of Visit Northern Tasmania, and several event and venue operators who um, spoke at the event at the Star Theatre. And I'm sure councillors have had the opportunity to take a look at the new look branding, but it's really fantastic. The website is great. And of course, now we know that we can start planning our mid-week um, trips to spend our vouchers. But for us, I'm really looking forward to seeing how our city branding uh, and the work that we're undertaking there in terms of our DNA, how that can link in really beautifully with the Visit Northern Tasmania rebrand. So congratulations to Chris and the team there. The second item I wanted to um, speak to was the development of our cultural strategy. And I wanted to recognise the work that has been undertaken uh, recently in terms of another round of community consultation. It was just tremendous yesterday to be on the stage of the Princess Theatre with representatives of the arts and cultural and education sectors for a world cafe and further consultation. We are, as a council, so close to uh, the adoption, hopefully the adoption of our inaugural um, City of Launceston cultural strategy. And the feeling that was present yesterday was one of great optimism, one of great opportunity, and one uh, of knowing that our community more than ever needs the arts, needs culture, needs vitality, needs food, needs footy, needs sport, needs all of the things that are woven into the cultural strategy more than ever to um, continue to thrive post this pandemic. So um, that was fabulous. And there is, as you might have seen, the opportunity next Wednesday evening to consider that conversation with members of our community via an online Q&A uh, to feed into the final community consultation of the, the strategy, as well as our online survey, which is open, I think, for another week. And that links perfectly into the third and final thing that I wanted to mention. I'm absolutely thrilled today to announce that not even um, coronavirus, the pandemic, can stop the ArtRage exhibition. Now in its 26th year, ArtRage is an initiative of the Museum and Art Gallery, and it draws on the work of students um, studying at pre-tertiary level in years 11 and 12, art, photography and production students. And of course, what a year it's been for young people. So the opportunity for them to know that they still have the opportunity to have works um, selected to be part of this travelling exhibition, I think is really important. And so we're delighted to announce that Outrage will once again hang on the walls of the QV Mag opening in late December and then touring the state through until March. And I think this is a really wonderful, tangible way of us knowing that we're trying to grow an audience um, and trying to grow interest, passion and love for our QV Mag. And what better way to do that than to connect with young people, with families who show them the artwork that they've so passionately produced. Are there any count, any additional councillor reports? Yes. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you. And uh, just on your uh, note regarding the cultural strategy and next Wednesday, maybe Mr Norman could avail himself of uh, his ratepayer and citizens' rights to attend that and give us some feedback directly on, on that. Definitely um, open to all members of the community, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, I'm just expecting that he's been asking questions. Maybe he can put some, some questions in and add some value to that. Um, just wanted to make comment just on the Mayor's announcement. I attended the uh, Vietnam um, commemorative service on Wednesday, for Tuesday, I think it was, Tuesday this week, uh, with the Mayor. And I just have to just highlight the guest speaker who was Terry Byrne, who would be known to many of you, and his articulation, not so much, in, as he said in his own speech, a lot of the prior year speakers have focused on the battles of Long Tan and lots of other activities that happened within Vietnam. Uh, he spent his focus talking about when they came home and how, how disowned they were by the country and, uh, and being left out in the cold for so long and, and really the importance of the Vietnam Vets Association uh, and noting that Launceston is the oldest one in the country 
uh, and that that fellowship and the support that the City of Launceston have given that group over the whole of their life um, has been so well appreciated. But certainly it was really interesting, and I do have a copy of the speech which I asked him to send me, so if anybody else would like a copy of his speech, I'd be more than happy to share it with them uh, because I think it was really great for those of us that didn't uh, um, have the pleasure or otherwise of uh, going to the Vietnam uh, War um, to understand what some of them went through. So I think that was uh, a really, really good thing. Um, next one, I just wanted just to note to everybody that Hans Van Pelt, the new CEO of Launceston Airport, uh, will be, um, I think I think he's in hibernation down here for, for his two weeks and I think comes out next week. So he'll be uh, live on the job uh, from about next Wednesday onwards. So I'll look forward to having an opportunity for him to come and address the council at some stage. Um, and I just also want to just, the theatre is starting to liven up and it's good to see that the uh, culture strategy was on the Princess Theatre yesterday, but also in the background there was also uh, Friends of Theatre North who were holding their speakers program that happened about once a month. Um, you go for a, for a cup of tea and listen to a, a good speaker about the arts and yesterday I had Stella Kent so I just uh, asked councillors to keep their eyes out and anyone else in the public that might want to go along a very cheap price of I think about $10 to attend it may even be less than that uh, in COVID times to go and listen to a really entertaining arts uh, speaker in, in the country so just uh, just letting you know the arts are starting to rise above um, the, uh, the COVID, cr COVID crisis Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Any additional councillor reports? We'll move to item 12.2, questions without notice from councillors. Does any councillor have a question that they'd like to ask? Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Deputy. Um, just the um, gravel part of the Riverbend Park on the eastern end, I was out there the other day and there was uh, 100 mil of water across the, the gravel part of it and I actually checked it out again yesterday and it's got potholes that are dangerous right through there. Now, I don't know how many people walk that way, but it's probably, if Shane can... Do we actually own that land, Shane, or...? CEO. So he's referring to the land. Which land are you referring to? The paths on the on the levee or the paths through the actual um, park the itself? Car park, the car park on the eastern side the of, of the Asheville, yeah. That leads up to the bank. It's just uh, potholes and it's sort of dangerous, in my opinion. General Manager Everhart. Uh, yes, we do own that land and um, it has some drainage issues that we've been unable to resolve without... Uh, a significant expense so we're still working through how to fix that at the moment we have no funds allocated to uh to seal that area can can we get it uh the potholes sealed or graded or something if, if someone falls down in there or kids hurt themselves i think we I'll, should just fill up the potholes or something i'll raise a customer service request for it to be reviewed good man thank you thank you um Thank you, General Manager Eberhardt. Councillor McKenzie. My apologies, my hand is still up. I'll take it down. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I note that we have um, progressing through the um, planning process uh, the application by the Veolia to establish a uh, recycling plant in Churchill Park Drive. I just wondered, I, I, I note that this uh, application originally came to Council last year and that it's been on hold for some quite some time and it's now returned. I'm just wondering if there is any um, one who can just um, explain what, what that process uh, was about and um, what the what, six, seven, eight months delay was in the process. Thanks, Councillor Walker. General Manager Hurst. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just um, clarification, um, Councillor Walker, uh, you mean was originally lodged with Council? Yeah, last I thought it was. Yes, I thought it was. So no, it didn't come to Council, but it was lodged with Council. Yeah. Um, 
sometimes these things um, come in and then there's um, it, it takes some time for um, requests for further information to be responded to. I don't have the specific details in front of me, but I know that this is one that um, there was some um, time delays between um, requests for further information, that information coming in, but I'm happy to happy to respond offline with some more information if you if you like. So typically those things would be like uh, perhaps a, a noise survey or something like that. I don't have the specifics in front okay. of me. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Walker? No, thank you. Are there any additional questions from councillors? There being none, let's move to item 13.1, noting that Councillor Spencer um, has declared an interest in this item. Do I have someone to move the um, the item tender review committee meeting of 6th of August? So moved, Acting Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cox. A seconder? Happy to, happy to second, Dep Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Cox, do you wish to speak to the item? Look, I, I do thank you, Deputy. Briefly, um, only to, to mention that this was something that was uh, put in train I was told it was about eight to ten years ago, or maybe longer, by uh, former Mayor and Alderman Tony Peck. And whilst Tony is uh, not in good health at this moment, I understand he was uh, in good enough health to be very excited that this has finally, finally made the uh, made the paper. So maybe we should call it the uh, the Peck Wayfinder. But yeah, it's uh, it's a good thing. It's finally come to being, and uh, it uh, went through all the cro proper processes. And the uh, final submission, as the paperwork says, went to Flying Colours. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Just uh, a couple of words to add to that, and so I'm very pleased to see it happening as well. But I guess it's more just about the process of the Tender Review Committee that we are publicly announcing who wins the tender. Uh, we're publicly announcing what they were they're being paid for it. So, so there's total transparency as to uh, who was the successful tender, and anybody who may have tendered for the project uh, who was unsuccessful can now uh, follow up uh, if they wish to and get uh, you know, responses from our officers as to why they may or may not have been successful. So I think that, you know, there's no way that uh, anybody can say that we don't know, that they don't know who's getting and winning these tenders and how much they're paying for them. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Walker. My apologies, again, the hand up. Uh, any other contributions? Councillor Cox, do you wish to close? No, I'd like to thank Councillor McKenzie for adding that bit to it. It's, uh, it's important that people are aware of the process. We now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those against say no. The motion is carried. Item 14.1, Council Workshop Report. Someone to move that item? Happy to move that. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. A seconder, please. I'll second that for you if you like. Thank you very much. It's your choice, of course, Councillor Harris. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak? Yeah, look, I, I just, I guess all of the items that we've spoken about in workshop are noted there. And I think that just showing the breadth of things that we do at Council, uh, you know, many of these things are not perhaps uh, at a stage where they can be publicly released, but will be in due course as they reach a, a logical conclusion of their aspects. But, you know, it's great informative uh, information for us as councillors and assist us greatly in our future decision making. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Harris. No, nothing more to add to that. Does any councillor wish to add to the item? Councillor McKenzie, anything further to say? No. We'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those against say no. The motion is carried. We move to item 18.1, the nature strip policy. The approval of the nature strip policy. Do we have any speakers to the item? No. Kelsey, no. No submissions. Someone to move the item. Councillor Council Dawkins. Thank you, Councillor Dawkins. A seconder. Councillor Spencer. Councillor Dawkins, do you wish to speak to the item? Yes, I do. Um, it's. I'd like to thank Council officers for bringing our first um, nature strip policy to Council. There has been a, a lot of commentary, I guess, over the last decade or so uh, since the economic, the last economic crisis around 
better use of nature strips and, and urban spaces for growing food, for uh, beautification of our communities. And I think probably what that decade has shown for somewhere like Launceston is that we really have an unbroken chain of family gardeners and family gardens, which really preclude this kind of work being undertaken on nature strips. Um, interestingly, the reason that food is, hadn't been grown on nature strips is because of the lead in petrol and nobody would ever have wanted to eat it. But of course that time's changed and, and we could now allow for up to 60 centimetre plants if they're not on the corner uh, to be grown. And I think the main reason that we would ever do it is to show community members who haven't grown up in a household with a lot of fresh food, what fresh food is and what it can be for the community. Um, a research project that I've been working on showed that children who don't have access to fresh food really, really enjoy fruit. And I think that's very obvious why that natural high sugar content is something that children are attracted to and appeals to them. So this policy does not preclude that kind of use for communities should they wish to do that. And I think that's really, really important. I've had a number of stakeholders contact me over the years to say, we want to see more of this. And I think it with a real interrogation, we can say that this policy does cover those kind of needs. So, of course, there are um, restraints and constraints around what people can do as there should be because there's a lot going on underground as well as the overground, um, the wires that need to be protected. Um, I'm not sure if anybody knows my nature strip, but one of the first thing I did when I moved in here was, was plan it out because I just thought that's what you did. Uh, not not really giving careful consideration to what a nature strip is, is there for. So I'm really glad to see that um, retrospectively, I, I probably won't be approached unless there's an issue. And I think it's important for people to know that, that anybody who has planted their nature strip can continue to do so, providing that it doesn't this doesn't cause any impediment for people who are cycling, for pedestrians, or of course for people who are um, entering from side streets and need to have a clear line of vision. So I think this policy covers it all. I think it's good to have one. Um, it could be open to future amendments should that be applicable. But for now, this policy um, covers everything that people who have uh, um, contacted me wanted to see and, um, and I'm supporting it today. Thank you, Councillor Dawkins. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Deputy. Um, one thing I've learnt about this, um, you can actually park in your nature strip, which I'm not fully uh, agreeable, but apparently it's not against the law to park in your nature strip. Um, second point, um, there's not many people probably know there's a council who actually mow the lawns for elderly people that can't do it, which is a great, great thing, I think. And the third thing is you can't actually put gravel or concrete on the nature strip um, and you can't actually put um, fake lawn. So I'm thinking fake lawn is probably not a bad idea if we could change it, that you can have fake lawn on your nature strip. Um, as far as putting gravel on it, I do. I had a phone call last week about this where someone actually put gravel on their nature strip and they're using it as a park and bay and I don't think that would be correct. Would that be right, um, Shane? Uh, that would be correct. All right. Uh, thank you. That's all. Thanks, Deputy. Thank you, Councillor Spencer. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, Look, I, I just want to commend the council for a great job. I think it's something that's been well overdue, gives clarity and gives a basis on where we need to measure things going forward um, because I think you know, there's two good things with nature strips. One is I think they do create some amenity with its own, but they can look very ugly if they're not well maintained. Um, I think clarity about who's responsible for it. I must admit, until I saw this policy, I thought that uh, council was responsible for the nature strips in front of people's houses. Um, I think we need to make sure people are aware of the fact that they are. And I guess where we were wandering around in Gledo Street and other streets near there today, there are a few nature strips outside of businesses that probably need some attention uh, by the owners or the lessees of the, you know, the, the tenants of those properties. So it's a question of whether 
as a part of doing this particular policy that we ought to use this to sort of say the policy is now released and just noting what the obligations are for people who have nature strips outside and in front of their places to sort of see whether we can improve the compliance aspects of that. Aspect, uh, that. So by using the, the, the launching of the policy as a basis to sort of improve compliance. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Are there any additional contributions? Uh, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, just to, to echo those comments uh, from Councillor McKenzie, um, I can see that this policy, and I do congratulate the council officers on the work and bringing it to this point, um, but I can see that uh, this policy, you know, could well be fine-tuned over the years, over the coming years, and, you know, the experience of it and as people become more aware of the possibilities um, will be that, um, you know, this, this is the sort of thing that, it could grow, if you'll excuse the pun. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd look forward to, to contributions uh, from the public, uh, uh, you know, as to um, any ideas that they might have and wish to explore in, uh, in the future. So, yeah, well done all around. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Walker, for, for that. Any additional contributions? Councillor Dawkins, would you like to close? Um, just in saying that for anybody who is listening or and, and wasn't aware that they, they did have this responsibility, um, you know, from my perspective, mowing a nature strip with fossil fuels just is completely unsustainable, doesn't make any sense at all. So now that we have some parameters around what can be grown, some really lovely ground covers that, that suit, you know, your the character of your neighbourhood and what you're hoping to, to have on display for your home is a much, much better choice than a lawn in my opinion. Thank you. Let's put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those against say no. The motion is carried. Thank you. Item 18.2 under the Infrastructure and Assets Network, Deputy Municipal Emergency Management Coordinator. The two recommendations there, looking for someone to move that motion. Oh, happy to move. Thank happy you, Councillor. And thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor McKenzie. I think Mr Denham is an excellent nominee for the position given the uh, excellent work he's done in this area over many years. So I'm very happy to uh, support both recommendations. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Cox. Can't find words any better. Is there anyone who can find any words? Are there any other speakers? No. Councillor McKenzie, anything further you'd like to say? I think I think the snow said it all. <laughs> Let's put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those aye. against say no. And we congratulate and wish Mr Denham all the best in that important role. There being no further, that motion is carried, of course. Um, there being no further items on the agenda, we will close the meeting at 2.07. And indeed, if this was, I'm not sure if it was, but if it was the last online meeting, we thank uh, certainly all of the staff who have made it happen over the weeks that we've been, the months that we've been online. And we, uh, we congratulate ourselves for the way that we've been able to adapt um, to this model, but to the staff, thank you for the wonderful way that you've um, you've shone the path, shone the light on the path through this uh, through this unusual time. We'll close the meeting. Here, here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well said. Here, here.